There was a summit back in 2015, 2016, where the Pope, along with the leader of the Protestant Church, the Archbishop of Canter Canter um, Archbishop of Canterbury, he's the head of the Anglican yeah. Church, yeah. yeah. All right, Canterbury. He announced the end of the Reformation, and they all united. Here's the question. How accurate is that, and what is your position on the ecumenical movement, on the ecumenical movement? Well, that's a very uh, in-depth question and a very uh, important question. Mm -hmm. So it is true, Sonetta, that those people from those groups said that, in my understanding. And it is true that there would be certain people who would even be Protestants who would agree with them. I'm not one of those Protestants. I do not agree with them. If you mean the refer the date on the calendar and we're no longer having a reformation in the same way historically as we were, okay, that's technically true. But in the sense of that we don't need the reformation or we don't need to keep on reforming or the reformation was not needed, I strongly disagree with that. Let me tell you why. The office of the Pope is not mentioned in the Bible. The whole edifice of the Roman Catholic Church, the whole way it's structured is what I mean by that. It's something that is not biblical. It's tradition that has been tacked on. And a lot of Roman Catholics even admit that. But the thing is, they'll say, well, yeah, we're supposed to also follow tradition. So as a Protestant, we say tradition is OK as long as it co doesn't contradict Scripture. But tradition cannot be an ultimate source of authority. And the Roman Catholic Church essentially does that through the Pope and the Magisterium. So I do not agree with those kinds of statements at all or Protestants who make them. doesn't so what mean I they doing. They were trying to unite the forces, though, right? Yeah, you so can't why you don't find nothing good in trying to unite. OK, so I do believe in unity around truth so I can unite with people of the other denominations as long as Christ is king in their theology. And when you put the pope as an authority over the church, they call him the vicar of Christ. When you put the pope in a place he does not deserve and they essentially in the Roman Catholic Church treat the pope like royalty. They kiss his ring. They call him holiness, father, all these kinds of terms that he does not deserve. And no, no head of the church deserves that kind of language to them, except for Jesus Christ. So when a person has that, then there's a problem with who is king in your theology. So I can't unite. In a, now, maybe we could unite in cleaning up trash in the neighborhood. Mm. Maybe we could unite in um, even supporting legislation that would uh, ban abortions. I'm pro-life, so I can unite with them, but I cannot unite in any ecclesiastical setting where it looks like we're doing the same thing. I don't mean I can't be friends with them. I don't mean I can't shake hands with them. I don't even mean we can't agree on certain. I don't mean any of that. I'm just talking about uniting and saying the Reformation is over until the Roman Catholic Church gets rid of the Pope, gets rid of the Apocrypha, gets rid of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that has all types of unbiblical doctrines. Until they get rid of that, there will be no unity with Rome, and the Reformation is still happening. That's what I say. So, so hold on here. You're talking about getting rid of the Father? <laughs> I don't mean well. I don't mean assassinate them. I just no, mean no, removing no, the no, office. Of not. We're not talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking about remove them from from the teachings or something like that. Remove them. Get away from it because you're saying that there will not be no unity. Nah. As long as he's in that position, that's what you're saying. And yeah, that is what I'm saying. And I tell you what, the hardcore Roman Catholics watching us, they know what I'm saying is right. The soft Catholics will be like, well, that sounds kind of judgmental. But the hardcore Roman Catholics, they're like, yeah, that's right. Until this renegade Protestant comes with the authority of the Bishop of Rome, then he can't be down with us anyway. In fact, he's outside of the church. That's what they think about me. They think I'm renegade against the only established authority that Christ has set up. I say, when did Christ ever set up the office of the Pope? Now they're going to go to Matthew, but they're going to be wrong. And we can show them from scripture and history that they're wrong. And here's the thing. Let's say, you know, you're not a Christian. You're hearing this debate from the outside. I get that. But just check this out. Here's a, here's a, here's an argument that I think is very important in the new Testament letter, Sonetta, uh -huh. the two offices, meaning the two roles of authority or two positions that are sort of officially recognized in the new Testament are mentioned in the letters of the new Testament, specifically first Timothy and Titus. Those two letters are written by the Apostle Paul to pastors, and that's why he gives in those letters qualifications for two offices. And here's the only two offices he gives the qualifications for. Elders 
deacons. Now, there's other words for elders. You could translate it as overseer, presbyter, uh, even bishop. Those are all the same thing, just with different words. Elders and deacons. And it, it pastors are elders, by the way. So that is also synonymous. So here's the thing. Where is the qualifications for the office of pope ever laid out? Not in there. Because it's not even an office mentioned in the Bible. So how is the Bible going to have in 1 Timothy and in Titus? Rules has to be apt to teach, has to have a good reputation, has to manage his household well, has to be someone who's not violent, can't be someone who's greedy, can't be a new person in the faith, can't be a drunkard, has to, be, have, has, has to have only one wife. You go down the list, where's the office of the Pope? It's an absent. Why is it the office of the Pope? Why are the regulations or stipulations for it absent from the New Testament? Because it's not a New Testament office. It's literally something invented for uh, necessity, essentially. So you know, if, go ahead. So if that's true, yeah. how come the Pope have such a high-ranking file when it comes to, you know, Christianity and stuff like that in this biblical stuff? Well, honestly, it comes out of a relic from the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's a relic of. So what happens is the Roman Empire started to fall, and uh, they'll give different dates. But basically, by the late 5th century, the Roman Empire, as it was, no longer stood. Barbarians were at the gate of Rome. There was no real emperor anymore, and uh, they, co they couldn't guard the outer edges of the empire. They couldn't even guard Rome itself at that point. Well, what happened is Rome, as a society, basically fell apart. Well, who picked up the slack? What had happened is in the time that the Roman Empire used to persecute the Christians, Christianity had grown so much that it became the, the thing, the church became the thing that was the only uh, organization left standing, basically. So bishops, pastors became really the most important people in these cities. So how were the poor taken care of? It fell upon the Christian church. The Roman government wasn't doing it anymore. And other matters like who's going to legislate laws, who's going to raise armies. A lot of this started falling to the church and the church started taking power that was secular and temporal power unto itself, sort of by accident and by necessity and partially because of greedy people involved. But that's an oversimplification. And then you have this thing called the Holy Roman Empire that comes out of the ashes of the old Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was located centered in Germany. So it wasn't even Roman and it definitely wasn't holy. It was very crass and, and driven by force and power. And it wasn't really an empire in any meaningful way. But it was an important thing. And here's what happened. Different little localities started becoming important in Western Europe. So right now, because we're talking about Rome, we're talking about Europe. But that's not the only thing that's important. It's just that's we're, when you talk about Rome, you've got to talk about Western Europe is what I'm trying to say by that. Mm -hmm. uh, this does affect North Africa as well and other places, but they're not central in this particular part of the story. They are central in other parts of the story. Well, as the mid medieval era comes about, uh, the most powerful institution basically becomes the Roman Catholic Church. And people didn't even know there was an alternative. They thought that was the only game in town. Until the Reformation. The Reformation showed people we don't have to take our cues from a bishop in Rome. We don't have to send money out of our country over to Rome. We don't have to listen to him because they basically were treating the bishop of Rome, the pope at that time, like he was a medieval king himself. And if you look at a lot of things that Rome still does today, a lot of it comes out of the way people would treat medieval kings. I'm not saying it's identical, but you know, Vatican City is its own nation. He ha they have their own little uh, standing army. It's very small. They have their own postage. This is, It's still its own little city. And the reason is, is because these uh, rulers later on thought it understood it to be beneficial to be on good terms with the Bishop of Rome because the Bishop of Rome, that's what they call the Pope. He basically became like the kingmaker in medieval Europe. You had to kind of have the church's blessing. So this, this is all not what the church is supposed to do. This is none of this is the job of the church, all the stuff that the Roman empire, the Roman Catholic church was taking upon itself. But the problem is when the Protestants rose up and said, Hey, this is unbiblical. Look at the text. This isn't what we're supposed to be doing. Hey, why are you teaching this? My reading of it is this Rome had amassed too much power to want to let it go. 
So they're not going to listen. And Pope Leo X, that's the pope that combated, in a manner of speaking, Martin Luther, who's considered the spark of the Reformation. Pope Leo X was a perfect example of this. He was not a particular holy man or theological man. He was interested in building stuff, specifically St. Peter's Basilica. He was, build, he was building grand, beautiful buildings for his legacy. And so he can't let some German monk, Martin Luther, create problems for his fundraising activity because that's what Martin Luther did. He said, hey, look, you're going around selling indulgences, sonetta, indulgences, or where these folks would say, see this piece of paper? This will give Uncle Louis 50 years off of purgatory. By the way, purgatory is not even mentioned in the scripture. They would literally sell this to peasants and everybody else who would put money in the coffers. And then this piece of paper would make this person think, oh, I just cut Uncle Louie 50 years off of his sentence in purgatory. But it was a worthless piece of paper. Martin Luther called that abuse out, specifically with a, a monk who was a notoriously uh, unscrupulous fundraiser named Johann Tetzel. And Tetzel used to say, Every time a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. He had a little rhyme, you would say. It translates into English as a rhyme as well. And Martin Luther said, that ain't right. So the Pope said, let's kick out Martin Luther from the, from the church. And Martin Luther said, I don't care about being kicked out from your church because it's a false church anyway. So he took what's called the papal bull. Papal bull was basically something where the Pope sends you a nasty letter that says you you're in trouble. And this particular papal bull said to Martin Luther... You're kicked out of the church. Well, Martin Luther took it outside the city and burned it. So this was a way to say your authority means nothing if it's not upon the word of God. And to this day, Sonetta, true, we're not burning each other's letters and kicking each other out of churches for the most part. But it's still true that the church of Rome does not stand on Scripture alone, whereas Protestants say it's got to be on Scripture alone. So we still have a massive disagreement about the source of authority. And you can never agree if you don't have the same source of authority. All right. Um, can you please explain to us briefly what does Reformation what what does Reformation means and meant to the faith and practice? What does it mean? Can you uh, elaborate on that question a little bit? Yeah. What what does it mean to the um to the movement as far as the Protestants, the church and stuff like that? Well, the the Reformation is something that happened in history, starting in the 16th century, and what it what it means is that we don't have to listen to the authority. Of the Pope, we listen to the authority of Scripture, and a lot of Christians at that time were not aware of that. They thought the Pope was the only game in town. The Roman Catholic Church was the only game in town. Now we people realize that's not true. But, you know, it's interesting. We talk about the Reformation and what it means to the church. There's whole sections of the church, Sonetta, because mm -hmm. the church is global. It's not. It's never been just in Europe. It, it, we're just talking about Europe because we're talking about Rome. Like the Ethiopian church, they were never under the authority of Rome. You go back and you study the Ethiopian church's history, it goes back really far. Ethiopia was one of the earliest places in North Africa where uh, essentially the kingdom converted to Christianity, uh, essentially, that region. And they never were under the jurisdiction of Rome, thank God, and had their own systems of authority, their own governance and perhaps even influenced the Reformation. We don't know all the details, but at one point, Martin Luther, who, by the way, I'm not claiming Martin Luther was a perfect man. I'm just mentioning him because we're talking about history now. Martin Luther met with a, a member, at least once that we know of, of the Ethiopian church, a man named Michael. I believe he was uh, Michael the deacon, if I'm not mistaken. I have to check this out. Uh, I think a guy named Daniel Daniels has some good articles on this. But Martin Luther was impressed with the Ethiopian church's kind of autonomy, its separation from Rome. And the Ethiopian, I think, encouraged Martin Luther, like, you don't need Rome to do Christianity. And so my point is that we were never all supposed to be under one bishop in one city. It, it's not part of the gospel message. I mean, if there was going to be a, an important church that was going to lead the church of, of or over the whole globe, it seems like it would be in Jerusalem if it was going to be anywhere. But... That's not even what the Bible said. The Bible never said you have a headquarters in Jerusalem. Christians are supposed to be the kingdom of God all over the earth, and we don't take our marching orders from a, from a guy in Rome, especially one 
who doesn't even follow the scripture himself. You know, he does practices that are unbiblical and takes upon himself titles and accolades that he should not have. Let me give you one real quick. There's a doctrine called papal infallibility. Now, some people would misunderstand because of the, the term papal infallibility. They think it means, oh, he's perfect. No, the doctrine is not that he's perfect. They don't teach that about their pope. But they do teach that whenever the bishop of Rome makes a statement ex cathedra, meaning from the chair, that means from his official seat or position of power and authority, on doctrine and faith that it is infallible because the Holy Spirit will never let the Bishop of Rome be misguided in those areas. Papal infallibility is not a biblical doctrine. The only thing infallible that Christians should understand to be infallible is the scripture itself. And I know you and I would disagree about that, but let me just show you one reason why I think that. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's about the scripture. You can't say that about a person, no matter how high and no matter how wise he is. And not even all the bishops of Rome, the popes have even been wise. There's some that their reigns were so filthy, Sonnetta, that they refer to it as a pornocracy. <laughs> A pornocracy. So the Bishop of Rome and the Roman Catholic Church edifice is something that is misguided. And the real reason there can't be unity between Protestant Catholics, it's not our fault. They just won't get rid of the Bishop of Rome and some other some other things that are standing in the way of true Christian unity. So if they would do that a lot, it would it'd be a great. But they'll never let that go. It's kind of like that's like their calling card, you know. The Bishop of Rome's okay. going to step down. Yeah, right. Okay. I That's like not that, gonna happen. Um, You are very knowledgeable when it comes to this right here. You really put in a lot of work. I respect that. Would you agree that much of the iconic classic measures taken during the uh, Reformation were done to hide the fact of Black depictions of Jesus, angels, and even God? So I've heard that uh, charge from um, certain I think they're essentially revisionist writers I've heard that charge from revisionist writers mm -hmm. but the fact is it's just simply not true and here's, here's how we know that number one there's things that are still standing that never got touched by iconoclasm before and after and understand, this is just art we're talking about. When you talk about iconoclasm, it's a Protestant impulse to rid the church of images, essentially. Now, initially, the focus was on images that are used, and we would say misused, for worship purposes. Now, Rome says we don't worship images. We revere them or show them devotion, but we don't worship them. We would say, well, it looks like worship from the outside, even though you don't use that word. So Protestants had an iconoclastic movement. The, the, the soft version, Sonetta, of iconoclasm is we vote to remove this out of the town square. We vote to remove this out of the church. The hard version is rioters going into the churches by force removing these items or destroying statues in the town square and things like that, right? And they wouldn't, they wouldn't even have these iconoclastic parties where they would start burning stuff and gathering it up. And as you can imagine, it got kind of rowdy in these little towns, and there's really no way to control them. And so people would join in just because they wanted to be anarchists. So you would have drunken, crazy guys like, oh, I get to burn crap and kick stuff and throw stuff. So they would join in too, you know what I mean? So it wasn't just the Protestants – theology became sometimes a lot crazier than that. And so we have to deal with that fact. Iconoclasm sometimes did get out of hand. But here's the thing. When you look at the writings of why they say what they were doing, it doesn't have anything to do with removing supposed uh, statues and paintings with black features. And the, the point I made also is not everything was touched. There's stuff that remains that is of varying types of quality of art that represents all kinds of features. Here's what I mean by that. There's still black Madonnas that are around. Now, I'm not into Madonnas because I'm not into having statues of the Virgin Mary and a little, and a little baby or whatever. I'm not into any of that. But 
if you are into that and you're trying to totally destroy any evidence of anything black within Christianity, then wouldn't you destroy all the black Madonnas? So the people who have this conspiracy theory, they have to say, well, they didn't touch them or they didn't get them. But that doesn't make sense. When you study the history, you find out there's a lot of places in Europe where the most uh, revered statue in this little town, like in Poland, for example, to give a real example, will be some black Madonna statue that's really old. So it's just simply not true that that's what iconoclasm was about. People have misunderstood iconoclasm to try to use it to say that it's essentially whitewashing. But it's not. Iconoclasm is Protestant impulse to destroy images and, and religious art that is used for worship that we feel distracts from what worship is supposed to be because we're not to make any graven images. We don't want pictures and paintings and statues. And if you study the history of this, you'll see it's a very true thing because people talk about white Jesus. White Jesus is a real thing. And that's by, got, what I mean by a real thing. It's, it's something that's been perpetrated upon the world. A uh, fair skinned Jesus that looks like a Dane or a northern european i'm not saying jesus looked that way i'm saying that's a true thing that that so it's not like whitewashing doesn't exist in some form or fashion but iconoclasm is not it and when you study the history of the puritans i think it's a perfect example so people a lot of times just lump all christians in one boat but when you study the puritan sonetta you'll find that they were iconoclasts so they Maybe. no pictures no statues so the initial people who came to America, and I'm not talking about Jamestown, I'm talking about Plymouth and those who came to the to the larger colony that eventually became the Boston colony there, uh, Massachusetts Bay. Th as far as the religious spectrum, they were mainly iconoclasts. So when you look at the beginning of America, you don't see a bunch of white Jesus is running around. That's kind of a European Roman Catholic thing. And early America had a lot of anti-Roman Catholic sentiment in it. Now, I'm not saying it was always right. Sometimes it resulted in violence against Catholics. I'm not okay with that. But there's a book you should read called The Color of Christ. And I'll let you ask your next question. I'm going to go grab this book off my bookshelf yeah. that says what I'm saying. Because someone may say, where's the facts? There's facts to this. I'm not denying whitewashing, but I am telling people iconoclasm is not whitewashing. That's not what it was designed for. It was something else entirely. Here's the book that I was mentioning. This is an excellent book. And this is, you know, not just some apologetics book. This is a scholarly book. Really good. And it talks a lot about what I'm talking about. Excellent book. Got a dope cover. And there's some other good books I recommend on this. For example, uh, and this shows how early Christians envision the divine. And it talks about different kind of versions of Jesus within Christian art historically and shows pictures of them as well. Let me and say this real quick. When I met up with Vocab Malone and Phoenix, <laughs> this brother came with a suitcase of books. <laughs> so I know where his scholarship level was at. He's not just speaking out this out of his own mind. This brother have his sources. He is well documented and he comes with, with his information. So when you catch up with uh, Vocab and he know he's going to be somewhere and do an interview, you best to believe he's going to have a suitcase full of books, y'all. That's real talk, man. Go ahead, brother Vocab. So, yeah, those are two good ones that tell about this. And and the charge of iconoclasm being an excuse to whitewash, it's just not true. And the funny thing is people will sometimes say, oh, look, here's a picture of somebody actually changing an image. And I'll say, wait a minute. So you're telling me this is a secret conspiracy and you have a picture of somebody documenting, showing you they're doing it. And whenever you look at the, what the picture is that they're saying is somebody whitewashing an image, it's almost always somebody cleaning something. <laughs> they're restoring it or something like that. And they'll say, oh, look, it's actually whitewashing it. But it's just not true. Now, again, I'm not denying the reality of whitewashing. For example, uh, the early European uh, scholars and all that, they couldn't even believe that Africans built a lot of the Egyptian civilization and some of the other miraculous um, things that we found, not just in Egypt, but in other places in, in Africa. They would they would say, oh, maybe uh, some other group of people came in here, moved in here. They would make up stuff. That's true. But that doesn't equal iconoclasm being whitewashing. Uh, and so I just want to bring that out. But I love the question. How many been dropped.